Hello there and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. I am Vlad and today I have a very special guest who has worked for years on a privacy implementation which might just end up in Bitcoin because he's the creator of Litecoin and Litecoin is very similar in design with Bitcoin. So basically every soft fork that they implement is compatible with what Bitcoin is and can do. So it's really interesting that this proposal for extension blocks, which I think belongs to Johnson Lau, I think that's his name. Mm -hmm. And then there was Mimble Wimble, which was created by Tom Elvis Jedisor. These two proposals that initially were purposed for Bitcoin found their way into Litecoin right now. And it's like a very light and scalable version of confidential transactions. And I think it's really cool. And I'm very happy that I get to have you here, Charlie, and ask you questions. Hey, Vlad, I'm happy to be here. So as I recall, it was 2018. I was working at Crypto Insider and I was paying a lot of attention to what you were up to. And you published a picture on Twitter of all of these privacy proposals that you were reviewing at the time. One of them was confidential transactions by, I guess, the Blockstream team. There was Greg Maxwell and Dr. Adam Back were involved. And yet, even if it seemed at the time that you were searching for a way to implement confidential transactions, you chose Mimblewimble, which was kind of the cool kid on the block at the time. And it launched, I think, in late 2018 with Grin. And it's very different from every design. It has its trade-offs. But why did you go for Mimblewimble as opposed to, I don't know, zero knowledge proofs or ring signatures or every other proposal out there? That's a good question. So um, the, the goal I had was to um add more fungibility to to litecoin so uh, fungibility is one of the properties of sound money that is kind of missing from from bitcoin and litecoin so that's something i wanted to fix and um obviously with fungibility you need some sort of privacy right if something is not um if it's not private then it's not fungible um the reason why i went with nimble wimble so Initially, I looked at confidential transactions, right? The What was important, I thought confidential transaction, which made all the amounts hidden, basically brought us 90% to um, fungi 90 of fungibility, right? It's, it's good enough for most people if you're just not showing everyone the amount of money you're, you're sending. Um, so confidential transaction was, um, seemed really achieve that goal. But the problem with confidential transaction is it's not very scalable because um, transaction size is like 20 times the size of a normal Bitcoin like one transaction. So it's basically making blocks 20 times bigger, um, which makes it not very scalable, reduces decentralization and everything. Um, what Mimblewimble did was it has confidential transaction, but also makes things more scalable. So using like cut through technology where inputs and outputs can be pruned, thrown away um, when, they're, when they're spent. So that helps with scalability. So it's kind of a, you get um, fungibility and privacy without losing much in terms of scalability. And it was a good trade-off. So I decided to go with that. Yeah, this is usually the criticism for stuff like ring, ring signatures. And I guess even Fluffy Pony would agree that Monero in its current form doesn't really scale. So you went for the newest proposal, which I guess was also the least tested and is still under development, but I think it's still a very interesting path to pursue. I wouldn't say it's the least tested. I mean, you have Grin and Beam who are both using Mimblewimble for many years now. Um, yeah, in terms of scalability, it's... Yeah, if you compare it to like Monero's ring signature, ring signatures, um, the the thing with ring signatures is every input will forever be in the blockchain, or for, will forever be in your um, uh, unspent transaction uh, UTXO, right? So that reduces scalability quite a bit. Um, and then stuff like Zcash, Zcash privacy and fungibility is, is like 
almost perfect or maybe even perfect, right? Except that it's really not scalable at all. Like transactions are huge, takes a long time to create them. Um, so MWeb or what I'm calling on Litecoin is called MWeb, which stands for Mimblewimble Extension Block. We're, we're implementing it using extension blocks. It's, um, it's, a, it's a good trade-off, I believe, between like scalability and, and fungibility. Yeah, and there's also this extension block proposal, which initially, if I'm not mistaken, was presented as an alternative to Bitcoin Unlimited, which at the time was a proposal for big block Bitcoin. And it seemed like there was a choice at the time between SegWit, between extension blocks and all of these ideas for Bitcoin. We went for SegWit because it provided, it, it fixed the malleability issue while also providing a quick scalability fix by increasing the block weight. Yeah. And so extension yeah, blocks were... was also the first one to implement it. But why extension blocks? So extension block was was um, proposed by Johnson Lau um, a while ago. It wasn't related to scaling when he proposed it, it was for adding a feature to, to Bitcoin, right? Where you can do it via extension blocks. It, and then it was used by um, a team um, uh, for to address Bitcoin scaling, where you can just basically use extension blocks to add more um, block space via soft fork without doing a hard fork. Um, but that proposal, I, I thought that was pretty silly doing that, just doing a scaling because you're adding a lot more complexity for just just to increase the, um, just for scaling, it wasn't really worth it. Um, and SegWit was a much better proposal. So in the end, SegWit won and it was implemented on or activated on Litecoin and then Bitcoin. And it really helped with both transaction malleability, um, uh, fixing and added a bit more scaling. And it was, it was good. Um, so the reason why I went with extension block for for um for for this for for adding mweb for adding mimblewimble actually i thought of using extension block before i decided to use mimblewimble because um just for for simplicity like so you can you can do confidential transaction without extension blocks basically you add more complexity to each transaction and each transaction you can do confidential transaction or not and i thought that was just too complicated and it was hard for um, harder for the community for the for everyone to start supporting confidential transaction. It was easier to do an extension block where you move coins from the main chain to the extension block. And once you're there, everything is confidential. So all, all the amounts are hidden. And then if you want to move back um, to the transparent side of things, you can peg out your coins back to the main chain. I thought that was a good way to kind of handle the opt-in side of confidential transaction. And then once I decided that uh, extension block was the right technology to use for implementing confidential transaction, I figured with extension block, you can basically do anything on the extension block side. So there was little um, disadvantage of actually doing a full blown Mimblewimble implementation, which helps with scaling and still has confidential transaction. So now what we have is we have Litecoin on the main chain in every every block has an extension block attached to it. And on the extension block side, everything is Mimblewimble. So you can you, you can move coins to the extension block. And once you're there, you're just doing Mimblewimble transactions. And if you want to get out of the extension block, you peg out of the extension block. So all that is um, just a lot simpler and a lot cleaner. And, and it works. So Yeah, this is something that I still don't understand very well as there are pegins and pegouts involved, which sound very much like stuff that you do when you're using liquid network on Bitcoin. You peg in mm -hmm. when you make a transaction that locks your coins, and then they get issued on the other network on the side chain. And when you peg out, they get burned on the side chain and they get unlocked on the base layer. But how does it work with extension block pegins and pegouts? Yeah, it's so I I describe extension blocks as very similar to side chains. So it's kind of like a side chain that's attached to the main chain. And it's 
the rules are enforced by the same set of miners. So with, with side chains, for example, liquid, um, the rules on the side chain is enforced by a, a federation, right? So federated side chain, so it's part of like seven, maybe 20 people. I don't know exactly how many right now. Um, and those, the majority of those can decide on if a transaction is valid or not, if enforcing pegins and pegouts. With extension blocks, um, the miners, after the software, the miners are enforcing the pegins and pegouts and all the rules on the on the extension block. So it's very similar. You peg in coins um, like a side chain. So what happens is on the main chain side, you're sending coins to a certain address, and that address kind of stores all the coins that are on the M website. So right now there's over a thousand coins you can actually see on the blockchain. That part is is transparent. You can see on the blockchain there's a thousand coins sitting there. Um, that represents all the coins on the M web side of things. And then when you peg out, coins will come out of this bucket right now, which holds a thousand plus coins that will send to you from that um, from that address. So that's interesting because there's also this mixing facility, or how should I put it? Because there is like a minimum amount of coins that need to get pegged in so that they they get issued on the extension blocks. Did I get that right? What do you mean by minimum amount? There's no, there's no minimum to peg in. So if I want to peg in like one Litecoin, I um, send up, I basically send one Litecoin to an MWeb address and that would do the peg in. It would um, send one, the, effectively the miners would send one Litecoin to this address that holds all the MWeb coins. And then on the MWeb side, it would um, create that one Litecoin on the M website. And then once you're there, you can move coins, you can move your um, like coins on the M website. And when you peg out, coins will get destroyed on the M website and this, this coin, the coin will get released from that address. Yeah, it was your example with a thousand coins that made me think that there's like a pool that needs to get filled. And this would help with making it harder to trace each individual transaction. Like in the case of coin joints, you put together the same amount of Bitcoin and, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes out, it's harder to figure out where it comes from. And I was thinking maybe it's the same, but if you say that it's only a matter of mining into the next block and it's not like a pool that gets filled and then gets released on the extension blocks, I mean, okay, maybe I, I just came up with a stupid idea on the spot. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, no. I mean, you can still do you can still do coin join on MWeb. Um, actually, coin join works better on MWeb because the the um, the amounts are are not public, right? The amounts are confidential, so you don't have there's no risk of someone matching inputs and outputs to try to figure out which input con connects to which output because you can't tell because the amounts are are confidential. Yeah, I remember having this conversation with. No Paro, the main developer of Wasabi. And mm -hmm. he told me that coin joints would work a lot better with confidential transactions if that was ever to get implemented. I guess not if it requires a hard fork. And even if it does require a soft fork, it seems like this bull market that great I'm grateful that is over, but has been very strange in terms of privacy. If you look at the performance of Zcash and Monero, and other privacy coins, it seemed like 2017 was a lot friendlier with the idea of privacy than 2020 and 2021, which was all about DeFi on some public ledger where everyone could see all the swaps and everything that you're doing. And uh, I don't see that as being the future of anything. And I don't want that to be the future or the norm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of the price of a coin is, is detached from the functionality. The fundamentals. I'm like today, more a lot more people are using Monero and Zcash than four years ago. Same for Litecoin. A lot more people are using Litecoin. The graphs of like usage and adoption is is just kind of through the roof. Well, not through the roof, but it's it's increasing um, quite a bit since four years ago. But the price hasn't. And um, yeah, all, all I can do is focus on on the fundamentals and adoption and making Litecoin better. 
Right. So the biggest concern that people have when it comes to privacy, especially on Bitcoin, is that they feel like losing the ability to verify every transaction and the amount and the participants might just lead to hidden inflation. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so long ago that there was, I don't recall the developer's name, but there was a core developer who made a mistake with one of the core versions and there was an inflation bug that could be exploited, but it wasn't. And we are still very fearful when it comes to inflation in general, because the whole very value proposition is that there will never be more than 21 million coins. And if anyone manages to exploit with extension blocks or whatever, some way to create more coins, I mean, that can destroy the value proposition of the project. Yeah. I think the, the bug you were talking about was, was just a, um, I think it was Mac Corallo that no, no, not time. him. No? He was also from Chain Code, I think, but not Matt Corello, not Blue Matt. John okay. something. He was also the one who wanted to change blacklist to blocklist. Hmm. Okay, anyways, there was yeah, there was a bug that was introduced, and I think one of the Bitcoin Cash developers caught it. Um yeah, so that was that was fortunate. Um but yeah, so it is it is true with with privacy um technology like um zcash monero uh, ring signatures and and mimble wimble there's definitely a risk of hidden inflation because you can't count right how many coins are, are out there so if there's a bug in the you know crypto or if the crypto is broken by um quantum computing for example then someone could potentially create coins out of thin air and it would not be um, noticed by anyone else. Um, there's, de there's definitely there's definitely a risk, um, more so than than Bitcoin, Litecoin, um, on a transparent blockchain. So with the way we're kind of handling this is we're isolating that risk to to the M website, right? So um, let's say you have you have a thousand coins pegged into M web. Right. So you have a thousand coins sitting on this address, which is holding all the coins on the M website. If there is a hidden inflation, let's say on the M website, there's actually now 2000 coins instead of 1000. So this is obviously a theoretical risk. Um, if there's 2000 coins instead of 1000, then you won't be able to peg out 2000 coins. Right? You'll only be able to peg out 1000 coins because there's only 1000 coins sitting there in an the address. If you try to peg out more than a thousand coins, that transaction will fail, right? Miners will not be able to create coins out of the thin air. So what would happen is there will be a flight to safety, right? People would, if there's a risk of um, of in, hidden inflation, everyone would try to peg out their coins. And once everyone pegged out, um, transaction will start to fail on the M website. And that's that would suck, but that's what, what, would, what would happen. But on the main chain side, there wouldn't be any inflation, right? So um, if everything works well, one Litecoin on both sides is equal in value, but if there's any um, concerns or if, if there's any hidden inflation, then value on the M website would drop. So there's always a risk. So I'm, obviously I tell people don't like peg in all your coins to M web, like, like give it some time for people to make sure that everything's okay, that there's no problems. I'm confident we're, we don't have any issue on that website, um, but um, but there's definitely a possibility and obviously quantum computing is coming. And there are, there are ways where we can um, make MWeb quantum safe. And um, there's already uh, switch commitments built in so we can switch. Um, it's very technical, but there's, there's ways to combat quantum computing when the time comes. Yeah, so just for the record, the developer's name is John Newbury. And okay. Matt Corello was actually the one who figured out after he read the disclosure by the Bcash developer that this Got can it. be very bad. Got it, yeah. And it, it was kind of kept under the rugs. They did not want to reveal or talk too much about it, but they discussed with the miners to quickly upgrade. And yeah, we need to be very careful about this. And my next question, actually, you opened quite a lot of Pandora's boxes there. 
especially with the quantum computing. But I, I want to ask you first, when do you think it's safe to say that this cannot be exploited for inflation? Is there like a time period when you know that it has been tested enough? Um, I mean, you, you can never be 100% sure, right? So there's always a chance that there's a bug in there. It's more, more likely that a bug will be introduced later on. So when we do like upgrades and um, fixes, we have to be careful not to introduce bugs, obviously. So that's, ha that's happened to a few coins where they didn't upgrade and introduce a bug, a hidden inflation bug and got exploited. There are some coins that really got really exploited for hidden inflation. Um, but yeah, so it's always gonna be a um, kind of the more time it's been out there, the more tested it is. But that's the case with with anything, right? Even with Bitcoin, um, the fact that it's been been running for um, 13 years gives people more confidence that there's nothing going to go wrong with it. Yeah, well, there are lots of eyes on Bitcoin, and there's a huge incentive to break it. I guess Satoshi's coins are the ultimate incentive, and as long as they don't move, we know that nobody hacked Bitcoin. I guess. Maybe that's the purpose. I know that also in the case of Litecoin, when there was the activation of SegWit, there was this bounty that was set up to prove that SegWit cannot be broken. And I was about to ask you if there is anything similar with Mimblewimble right now. Um, so the, the SegWit bounty was actually something I, I created. Um, basically, the, the idea was that if there's a pot out there, if if anyone can spend it, right? If there's a, a bug where miners can just steal from separate addresses, they would just take that money and, and run with it. But because it sat there for, for many, many months without it, anyone being able to steal from it, it kind of proved that um, Segwit was safe. So with, with MWeb, we didn't create like a bounty for, for people to, um, for that purpose, um, but, I think naturally people are putting slowly putting more and more money into the M website. So right now there's a thousand coins. That's that's only fifty thousand dollars, fifty sixty thousand um, dollars, but it's going to increase over time, and uh, I think that that will work fine. So how long has it been since M Web was deployed on the main net, and for how long has it been in testing on the test net? Uh, yeah, so it was activated on May nineteenth, so a little bit less than a month um, on testnet. We've been testing it on testnet since like, I think like February, maybe even January. Um, yeah, we've been packing away at, on testnet for a while to iron out all the issues. It's been quite a while. Like this has been in development for such a long time. I'm not sure if you regret that you kind of missed the bull market. But I guess it's better for testing and to make sure that this is dirty, as opposed to riding the hype wave and having more people pay attention and potentially breaking it. I guess <laughs> this is a better opportunity to figure out if there are any issues within the development team. And why has it been so long? Like, were there any hurdles along the way? I know that you hired a green developer. In the beginning, I remember I wrote an article in 2019, I think, that the the team behind Beam is going to be the one that helps bring confidential transactions into Litecoin. It ended up being green, actually. What's the story there? Yeah, so um, on, your, on your first question, there's, like, we're not timing development against... Um, Bull bear market, right? And there's really no way you would know and be able to time it. And it's hard to even say whether it's actually better to release this a year ago versus now. Um, I think it's actually better to kind of release it now when um, when the price is not going crazy, so people can focus on actually making it better and actually testing it and using it instead of just riding the hype wave. But it does, that doesn't really matter because we're not gonna we're not trying to time anything. In terms of why it's so initially what happened was we we're talking to a beam team right about them helping us with um 
implementing Mimbo Wimbo. Um, that took some time and then um, they got busy with other things. And then I we found um, David Burkett who worked on uh, Grin++ plus, plus for, for Grin, basically C++ implementation of Grin. And he was instrumental and in, I mean, he was the main guy in helping us implement uh, MWeb on, on Litecoin. So it took some time because it was basically just him, um, but we also wanted to take things slow. We wanna do it right and make sure there's nothing wrong with it. So we, we took our time. Um, it was more important to do it right as, as opposed to do it fast. In the end, in the grand scheme of thing, it doesn't matter if it took six months versus two years. Um, if we do it right, then it works and, and we're good. and hard money. There is no fiat on-ramp or off-ramp and you get to diversify your Bitcoin portfolio into gold or silver when you sense that a bearish moment is coming. Also, you can instantly trade your gold for Bitcoin to buy the dip. And if you're into gold custody, Voltoro can also send you the gold that you own directly from their insured Swiss vaulting facilities. Voltoro was launched in the aftermath of the Mt. Gox hack. So since 2015, they have published monthly glass books to prove that they own all the gold reserves and all of their customers' money. Sign up today by going to voltoro.com slash Bitcoin Takeover. Keep in mind that this is not financial advice and you are responsible for your own decisions. Wasabi Wallet is the perfect Bitcoin privacy wallet. It's free, it's open source, it's available on Windows, Mac OS and Linux, and it offers groundbreaking Chamian coin joins, which makes your Bitcoin. Even if you do not use the coin join feature, you still benefit from a trustless experience with block filters, a hidden IP address via Tor, and easy management of your wallet outputs. After you deal with KYC exchanges like Coinbase, like Kraken, Binance, Gemini or Bitfinex, you can remove the association between your identity and your Bitcoin address by performing a few rounds of coin joins. To find out more about the privacy benefits and limitations of coin joins, listen to Bitcoin Takeover Podcast Season 6 Episode 6 with Max Hillbrand. And if you want to give Wasabi a try, go to wasabiwallet.io and download the wallet for free. Wasabi Wallet, a Bitcoin privacy wallet for the citadels. Right, so a very important question that I have to ask and is one that some of the people I know, some of the Bitcoiners would ask is do you have to store extra transaction? Like, do you need extra transaction space on your node to be able to validate the extension blocks? As I know that a lot of people are very, very conservative and concerned with the growing blockchain in the case of Bitcoin and the idea that they would have to also validate and store the transactions, even if they're pruned on a different network, which is parallel. They wouldn't like it and they would have to upgrade their hardware. And is this mandatory? And how much of it is pruned and how much is actually stored there? Like what's the annual growth or something? Um, well, obviously, so the second part of your question, obviously the more people use it, the more um, it would grow, right? So 
Um, in terms of whether or not you have to um, validate it, it, it depends, right? So if you if you don't upgrade your node, um, it works just fine, right? So you would you wouldn't even know about the extension block, right? Your node would not even know about the extension block. Your node would see this, would validate all the transactions on the on the main chain side, right? Including peg ins and peg outs. You would see coins moving to this address that holds everything, coins moving out. But in terms of anything that happens on the um, Mimble, Wimble, and website, you wouldn't validate or even know about. So that's fine. If you want to continue to do that, that's fine, right? But then you wouldn't be able to um, use MWeb, or you wouldn't be able to send MWeb transactions um, and validate them. But if you are if you upgrade to 0 0.21.2, then you would validate both sides, right? You would validate the MWeb blocks. So there, obviously, there is more. Um, there is more, um, it's more, it will take more resources to validate and website of things and also store those transactions. In terms of um, uh, like pruning how much that, how much extra space it would take, um, like I said before, it depends on how much it's being used. Um, but it is a increase in block space. It, it is a um, block size increase, the uh, extension block. We did not, um, decrease the main chain block space to account for the increase in the mweb block space yeah that's where i was actually getting as having extension blocks also comes with extra block space that can be used yeah. for transactions and are the incentives any different the miners still mine these extension blocks but can this pose any kind of existential risk at any point um in terms of what, in terms of block size or something else? In terms of, you know, the Nakamoto consensus implies that after a certain amount of halvings, you're going to have to rely on fees. And how are the fees any different on the extension blocks? And especially if the extension blocks are bigger, I guess the amount of money that you pay for transactions is also small. So yeah, how, how does that play? So we, we made the fees, um, try to match the fees on the MWEB side with the main chain side. Um, in terms of Nakamoto consensus, um, nothing really changes, right? So over time, um, fees will need to pay for, for, the, for the mining, the security, the mining hash rate, right? So fees on the um, MWEB side would also go, go to the miners mining the block. Right. So there are fees on M1 transactions, there are fees on, on main chain transactions, and they add together to, to, um, to pay for to pay the miners. Um, interesting thing with, with Litecoin specifically is that Litecoin is merged mine with Dogecoin. And um, Dogecoin has um, basically um, infinite inflation, right? It just it's inflates a couple percent a year. Um, uh, but decreases over time, but it goes on forever, right? So the interesting thing with merge mining is now uh, miners mining both Litecoin and Dogecoin would continue to have the Dogecoin kind of inflation. So that kind of protects, sec helps secure Litecoin, even though Litecoin has a fixed number of coins, 84 million um, coins. So that's an interesting kind of dynamics between Dogecoin and Litecoin mining. Well, <laughs> let's hope Elon Musk keeps on talking about Dogecoin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it's still interesting to me because aren't the incentives changed? Like can, some miners, like is there a hundred percent acceptance of Mimblewimble among miners? Yes. Yeah, so it was done as a software. So with um, uh, it was miner activated. So. Right now, it's the software enforces that every miner actually has upgraded in this mining um, Mimblewimble, or sorry, mining uh, MWeb blocks, right? So every every block right now has an MWeb block attached to it, and that's enforced by miners. Yeah, I was thinking what happens if maybe a group of miners refuse to mine Mimblewimble blocks if there is any damage to the network? Yeah, I mean, if... If over fifty percent of miners decided to not mine Mimbo uh, MWeb blocks, then it will hard fork, right? There will be a chain without MWeb blocks, and the which chain that continues that has MWeb. 
it's no different than the 50% miners decide to mine 22 million Bitcoins instead of 21 million, right? Increase in the, the supply cap. If if miners decide to to um, change the rules, then it will be a hard for me. Yeah, but in this case, it's about privacy. And I guess the miners may not like privacy, especially if they have to be compliant with the laws of a certain jurisdiction. I mean, in, in the case of Bitcoin, I don't see it being activated with miners. It needs to be activated with nodes. And even if there is a UASF with Mimblewimble extension blocks or whatever way to acquire privacy, I can see it being censored by some miners. Mm, I mean, for the most part, Litecoin miners are, are the same group of people or pools, I should say, as Bitcoin pools. So I would I wouldn't be I wouldn't definitely say for sure that it, it wouldn't get activated by miners. Um, if something I mean, like this, does Litecoin have Maripool? Does Litecoin what? Maripool does does it mine Litecoin? Uh, no, no. You think that would be a pool that would be against it? Yeah, I mean they they were against transactions that were not ESG compliant or whatever that means. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why it's, it's going to be much harder battle on, on Bitcoin than it is on Litecoin. Um, and, um, in, in that sense, it's good to test it out on Litecoin to see how, how well it works and whether it's something that something like this or something different that we can add to Bitcoin in the future. In a sense, I liked the reception that Taproot has received, but in this regard, it was like something that was proposed more than a decade ago to switch to Schnorr signatures. It's still not a complete switch, but it's still an improvement and it brings lots of privacy benefits, but also scalability benefits. Still doesn't change the fact that all transaction amounts and all transaction recipients are visible mm -hmm. on the public ledger. So... I don't see it as being a big privacy improvement, even though I do remember some people were cheering and being like, oh, chain analysis is so doomed. This is the end of it because now we activated Taproot. There was <laughs> no. Um, I mean, but Bitcoin, I mean, it's it's still um the jury's out whether or not we we need um fungibility privacy on the on layer one. Right. So layer two solutions like Lightning do provide a lot more fungibility and privacy than, than main chain layer one solutions, than layer one. Right. So that may be good enough um, for most people. Um, so for Litecoin, we're just experimenting something different. Right. We're experimenting adding fungibility and privacy to as an opt in feature to layer one and see how well that works. Yeah. You know, Last year, we saw something very interesting with mining in Bitcoin. You had this exodus of Chinese miners, and most of them went to the United States. There was this sh shift of power or whatever. I don't know how we can call it, but still very interesting. It proved that it truly is also censorship resistant, but also plays this geopolitical game very well. But you don't have to comment on this because, you know, you're in a position where you cannot really make statements about this. But it's interesting to me that the Chinese were a lot friendlier with Bitcoin and they allowed it to just blossom. Whereas the Americans right now, when they got a lot of mining pools, they're trying to regulate the hell out of it and try to impose rules and say, OK, this is fine. These transactions are fine. These are not if you want to mine on our soil, you're going to have to respect these rules. And it was not like this in China, even if China is the more authoritarian country. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the end, it doesn't matter, right? So that's the thing about Nakamoto consensus about Bitcoin, right? How it's created. Um, it would just rot around it, right? So if, if one government bans mining, it will just naturally move to other jurisdictions that didn't ban mining, right? If one jurisdiction made um, electricity like a lot more expensive for mining, then it would just go somewhere else, right? Or if they created rules 
around it and miners don't like it, they'll move somewhere else. So um, Bitcoin would just, Bitcoin doesn't care, right? It would just work regardless what one jurisdiction decides, right? So I think that's, and that's good. And, and we'll see that happening more, like we'll keep seeing that happening. Yes, but at the same time, I still see big nation states, big like superpowers accepting Bitcoin just because they see that having mining under soil grants them more control over what happens to the network. And they can basically decide to be against certain changes, which also, I guess, include privacy, which is a very delicate topic. I know Bitcoiners who simply don't want it and think that it should come only on layers like lightning or whatever. Not even lightning is too private. It's still better than the base layer, but still observable. I don't know. It's a very delicate topic. It's something that I would like to see on the base layer, but it's just getting very hard. And the more ossified it gets, the harder it becomes to bring any kind of privacy to the base layer. Which is which is fine, I think. In the, I mean, it's 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 a thing with um, with decentralization, right? So. Um, things are a little bit slower, a little bit less efficient, um, and changes are changes are hard, right? So you don't want a system where change is easy, because then you get you just get crap, and you can easily become centralized. Um, so you want change to be hard, um, and you you want to need majority to change something, or right? you don't want, but then a minority a group can stop any change. It's kind of like the, the US constitution, right? It was, it's kind of, it's not set in stone. You can still change things, you can amend it, um, but it's hard, right? It's purposely made hard to hard to change. Uh, and that's that's good for, for the long run. Um, and that's the thing about decentralization. I think that's that's a feature, not a, not a bug. That's a very good point. And I want to get back for a minute to Mimblewimble extension block transactions. I do recall looking at a pegin and another transaction, which was just a simple, visible, non-private one. And there was a difference in size of about 20 bytes. I'm not sure how much that means. I guess it was like 15% or something in that particular example. But are you aware of a general difference in size between a regular transaction and the private one? Um, let me see. So you're not talking about not not about pegging, right? About like um, MWeb transactions. Yeah, MWeb in general. Um, I think it's about ten times the size. I have to I have to check. Um, so MWeb, MWeb transactions, because of um, range proofs, um, range proofs is basically proving. So because the um, you can do math with confidential transactions, right? You have A plus B equals C to make sure that no coins are created out of thin air. So I sent A coin, I sent A and B coins, and you got C coins, and that's fine. The only gotcha is that you don't want any of the A B's or C's to be negative, right? If I send, if A is five and B is negative 10, C is, um, sorry, sorry. If A is 10 and B is negative five, C is five, right? You can just, you can, or you can create coins out of thin air if you, if, if one of the variables are, is negative. So the range proof is to ensure that none of the um, numbers are negative. And that's, um, that causes transactions to be much larger because um, because you have to have a proof that shows that none of the um, numbers are negative. So um, that's why confidential transactions are, are larger. Um, and, but to the reason why MWeb is, is um, good for scaling is you can throw away um, inputs and outputs that are spent. So it's, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to compare one transaction with another transaction, because overall um, you have less inputs and outputs on the M website. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But it also makes me think that 
the average SegWeb transaction is like 120 bytes in size, if I'm not mistaken, because the fee that you pay with the minimum fee that you can offer, which is one, is about 128 or something like that. Um, I, I don't want to get into specifics, but the idea yeah. is that on the Mimblewimble side, if you do that with extension blocks, you're also going to have to occupy more block space, which is fine because it's an extension block, but still it needs to be designed around this whole idea. Whole idea of, of what, sorry? Of having larger transactions. So you need also bigger blocks to accommodate them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for SegWit, it doesn't increase this. It doesn't decrease the actual size of transactions. Right. It's just that the signature part is not counted towards the block space. So, um, so the the counted transaction size is smaller, but the actual transaction size is, is the same. I guess that's why Jihan used to say that it's unfairly cheap. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you're right. Um transactions are there is a trade-off for transactions are larger on using confidential transaction and um and web helps things by um being able to scale better in terms of pruning inputs and outputs that are spent um but it's still more costly to do a um private transaction or an web transaction than than a regular transaction yeah and i think that ring signatures and Zero knowledge proofs, as in Zcash, are bigger than ten times the average Bitcoin transaction, right? Uh, yes, for the most part, yes. Um, but there are other differences where, um, like for example, ring signature increases the the UTXO set, right? Um, all the time, right? There's it never decreases the UTXO set, even if a transaction is spent. Um, and that hurts scalability in, in different ways. Yeah. And I, I did notice that there's a lot of research into zero knowledge proofs nowadays. I did see a presentation by Amir Taki, who's very much in, immersed in everything ZK. Mm -hmm. Not sure if he wants to bring anything to Bitcoin, but it's still interesting to see that there's a lot of research into cryptography, into making this more scalable. And I, I do recall a comment by Andrew Polstra from Tabconf last year when he said that he can just put the entire Bitcoin blockchain into a ZK rollup and that solves the scalability problem. How does that work if you're acquainted with all of this? I'm not, I'm not um, familiar with, with that comment. Okay. Uh, I was just curious if you put any research into this kind of stuff. But yeah, Mimblewimble extension block, I think it's the most important proposal that I've seen in the last few years. I've, maybe since SegWit and Taproot, I see this as being the biggest soft fork. I'm not very much interested into Covenants and what they're trying to bring with BIP 119, I think. Mm -hmm. But I did play with Mimblewimble extension blocks, and to me, it was kind of a mind-blowing moment because this worked as a soft fork it's more scalable than the average proposal for privacy. And yet, if we were to bring it to Bitcoin, it would need, it would face a lot of adversity. So it needs to prove itself over time. And people need to accept that with privacy, they're going to get some sort of trade-off. And uh, one last question that I think I forgot to ask you about Mimblewimble is how much of the data about a transaction gets pruned? Um, so the way it works is um, you can think of a MWeb block as one big transaction, right? So um, this is how MWeb works, uh, or sorry, specifically how Mimblewimble works, right? So you get transaction get broadcast, there's inputs, outputs, and kernel and all the inputs and outputs get added together into one big transaction, and that's the block, right? So if you look at an MWeb block, you have inputs on one side, outputs on one side, on the other side, and then 
and then some kernels that represents transactions, pegins, pegouts, and whatnot. And then using um, using crypto math, you can add up all the inputs and all the outputs, and they sum up to the same number, right? And then so that's just one big transaction. Um, the with cut through, if an input spends an output, you can throw both of those away because the math will still add up, right? So if I send um, one Litecoin to you, you send one Litecoin to to Alice in the same in the same block then what's recorded in the block is basically just, I'm sending one Litecoin and Alice is receiving one Litecoin. The fact that it went through you didn't matter because you actually spent that output already. Yeah, and it's at a larger scale. There are many more transactions in the middle. And I guess that's the privacy benefit that we get. Yep, and then, um, and then that's within one block. But if, if an output is spent in another block, you can prune it later. We don't have that um, totally implemented yet, but that's something that can easily be done where um, if a input that is spent like uh, a month ago, it's not really useful anymore and you can just prune it from your, from your, um, uh, from the blockchain, from your kind of your copy of the blockchain. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh I think also I mentioned him again. Andrew Polstro was very much into this before I guess he gave up on the research. Unless he is Tom Alves Jedisor or something, or he, he has a be. name. He he put in he put in a lot of work on making uh, Mimbo Mimbo better. Um he's done a lot. He's very he's a, a very smart guy and he's he's helped helped out a lot on, on Mimbo Wimble. It's great. Yeah, he he might be the guy that actually created it. <laughs> uh, I suspect Peter Todd is, but anyway, uh, what was I about to say? Oh yeah, can the cryptography get so much better that it improves to a significant degree in a few years and the transactions get even smaller and it's more scalable? It's possible. I mean, um, the bulletproof was introduced a few years ago that decreased um size of trans of confidential transaction size by quite a bit. Um, and that was kind of discovered fairly recently after after many years of confidential transaction being out in the space. So so yeah, there's definitely possible room for improvement to make things even smaller and more scalable. Um, yeah. So I mean we'll constantly work on improving MWeb. Yeah. When I talk with people about bringing privacy to Bitcoin, they usually say that there was no mature proposal yet and everything is still in a very early development phase and it's risky to implement anything that's out there right now because something else that's better might just come out in a few years. But right now I think that this whole extension block soft fork but Mimblewimble is the closest that we are to bringing privacy into Bitcoin because it can be brought into the main chain without without requiring a hard fork and that's the biggest that used to be the biggest issue and it's also more scalable than most stuff out there but mm -hmm. yeah i guess it can get better uh I, I mean i think you're right but i think it will still take some time for um for for it to prove itself right for it to show that it actually works and there are definitely more improvements that can be made to MWeb. Um, so, so we'll see. I'm not, I don't expect Bitcoin to, to implement MWeb um, because it's just, it's a big change. Right? It's um, Bitcoin is a lot more conservative and I think that's good. So, so we'll see what happens in the future, but, um, but at least it's working on, on Litecoin and people can play around with on Litecoin to see how well that works. I did receive the MWeb torch from the community and I did fail to pass it to Fluffy Pony, so I gave it to someone else. But I tried to look it up on a blockchain explorer and mm -hmm. I realized that there's no data to show and there are not there's only one blockchain explorer right now. And I did also observe using command line inputs, I tried to look at the transaction data and there's nothing that you can see. If you're looking at a random transaction that happened, you're not going to be able to see the amounts or 
the recipients, which I think th that was the mind blowing moment. That's why we're doing this interview. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can't prove that you pass it. You maybe just stole the M-Web torch. Yeah. I paid someone else to claim that they received it. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I still, I have yet to receive the M-Web torch yet one day. That's a question that we actually received on Twitter. And I guess we yeah. can move into that. There's someone who wants to know when you're going to receive the torch. And also you did mention something about adding payment proofs. And I guess that becomes part of what's next for Mimblewimble. Yeah, to be able to uh, prove that you, you paid, um, which is fairly important. So it's something we're working on adding. Um, specifically, David is working on adding. Um, and other things we want to work on is like um, like coin, coin swap, right? Adding a, a coin join kind of implementation on top of MWeb, which could be very helpful. Yeah. Bamboo88 wants to know if SEC regulations will label Litecoin as a secured or a commodity. Um, that, I'm, I'm pretty sure it will be labeled as a commodity. I mean, um, it definitely fits a commodity and um, Gary Gensler has come out to say Litecoin is a, com is a commodity. So I don't see a reason why it would ever be labeled as a security because it's pretty much no different than Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I'm not kind of concerned about that. No, that that's the concern of XRP. But anyway, I don't want <laughs> I don't want to make any comments to get sued. Uh, Master BTCLTC wants to know: Would you like to know? He would like to know more about the current transaction capacity and the future capacity that can be enabled. That's very general. And also, he wants to know when you take the MWeb torch. In terms of capacity. Um, MWeb right now adds about one megabyte in block size space um, effectively. So um, if Lightning, uh, sorry, if Litecoin is one megabyte, SegWit effectively makes it two and MWeb adds another one. So it's effectively three megabytes right now, but MWeb, um, the block size can be increased 10X without doing a, a fork. By, by miners. So if, if necessary, we can increase the block size that way. Um, and if, yeah, so there's definitely room to grow and we, we just, we have a lot more space than we need right now. Um, so nothing to worry about in that front. SG6 Crypto wants to know if you're Satoshi Nakamoto himself. I am not Satoshi Nakamoto unless I have multiple personality disorders and one of my personality is Satoshi. But as far as I know, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like the kind of answer that Satoshi would give. Anyway, <laughs> Aristotle's money wants to know how Bitcoin saves, how Litecoin saves Bitcoin by removing the possibility of a single point of failure as in a government prints enough money to destroy crypto. I mean, Litecoin would also be affected by that, but you, you get to answer. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think just having an alternative currency, a cryptocurrency to Bitcoin gives resiliency to the whole network, right? Makes it reduces the, uh, removes a single point of failure, right? If, it, if there's only one cryptocurrency out there, then um, it can be attacked and killed. Whereas if there's thousands out there, um, it's impossible to take them all down, right? So um, it helps with with the whole um, whole cryptocurrency movement to have more than one, um, and that's kind of the the idea. Harry C O O seven 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 wants to know why the price does not reflect the fundamentals and is the market too emotional or behavioral behavioral um so yeah i mean i don't really know why price is what it is um i would yeah so litecoin has been doing well the past four years but the price really hasn't and it is kind of what it is we could just kind of kind of just follow the cycle. Um, I do have 
Um, yeah, I think I think it's going to do well in the future, but who knows how long that's going to take for it to recover. Um, but all I can focus on is is working on the coin and making the coin actually better. Um, people are actually using it. Just yesterday, um, BitPay released the stats for um, for people using cryptocurrency, um, paying with like coin and Bitcoin. And was it eighteen percent of all BitPay payments were done with Litecoin, which far um, surpasses what's paid with Ethereum, Dogecoin, any other altcoin out there. Bitcoin is still king. It has like 50 plus percent. Um, but Litecoin is, is doing well, right? The biggest payment, crypto payment processor, Litecoin was added um, less than a year ago to it. And it's been climbing up the charts in terms of uh, adoption. So that's definitely good news. Um, price is not reflecting that, but hopefully it'll catch up. M Solid L wants to know. Actually, his name is Matt Solid eighty seven. Wants to know if Litecoin will become legal tender in El Salvador. Um, I, that I don't know. I don't know. I think they're focused on Bitcoin. Um, I'm not legal. Legal tender doesn't matter that much right now. I think it's it's more of a gimmick. Um, I mean, I, w- I was in El Salvador last year. Not many people actually use Bitcoin and not most, not every store actually accept Bitcoin. I mean, it takes some time for, for the whole country to start accepting Bitcoin because a lot of places just work with cash, right? They don't even have an electronic system for accepting money. And um, yeah, I think it's cool to see like a country like El Salvador start um, accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, and I think we'll see more and more of that. In terms of Litecoin being legal tender, I don't know. I mean, it's not something that I'm focused on. Eric Bowman wants to know if there was any backlash from exchanges after adding Mimblewimble and if there's going to be extended wallet support for it, as right now you can only use it with Litecoin Core. Yeah, so in terms of exchanges, there there was some some issue which was expected because it came from Korean exchanges. So Korean laws are very, very um, strict on privacy coins. So if there's any kind of hint of some privacy tech, their um, the, the first reaction is to delist the coin just so that they don't, exchanges I'm talking about, just so that they don't get punished by the Korean regulators. Um, so they del- delisted all coins, including all privacy coins, including Monero, Zcash, even Dash. Um, so I wasn't surprised to, to have some kind of pushback from Korean exchanges. I don't know the status right now, um, but other than that, I haven't heard anything about um, exchanges not happy with, with MWeb. Um, and the second question is what? Uh, give me a second. I need to scroll up. Mm, wallet support for Mimblewimble. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, right now Mimblewimble is only supported by um, Litecoin Core. So we're working on adding it to um, Light Wallet and working with other um, wallet providers to, to add support for, for MWeb. So that's gonna take some time because it's a, it's a big change. Adding um, Light kind of SPV support for, for MWeb is, is not simple and we have to figure out how to do it well. And um, so it's, that's gonna take some time, but it's coming. And the last question comes from Louis Sangulo, and he has like four questions, but I guess they have the same answer. XMR atomic swaps, BTC atomic swaps, Doge atomic swaps, hot wallets implementing MWEB, MWeb. What's the question? So are there going to be any atomic swaps with other coins like Monero, Bitcoin, and Doge? In terms of like, uh, MWeb atomic swaps, or so. I mean, that's oh, that, not. That's, that's not a good one. I thought atomic swaps are only for Lightning, but now that you mention it, how does that work? So atomic swaps can work with Lightning, right? It can also work with Main Chain. So um, Decred has an implementation of atomic swap with um, Decred, Bitcoin, and Litecoin. 
I believe they also have a decentralized exchange where you can use these autonomous swaps to exchange coins. Um, so they could work with Doge, with any of these coins. Um, but the problem is it's not very, it's not that useful because it, because of the liquidity problem, right? Atomic swaps are not very, for decentralized exchanges are not very useful because it's hard, it's hard to get, create the liquidity necessary for them. Um, so a centralized exchange is it's just much easier for liquidity. Um, so the, the, I would say the demand is not there for it, but the technology is, is there and can be used. Um, and then the last part is what? Uh, j just a second. I need to find that again. Hot wallets for MWEB. Um, I'm not sure what he means by that. Cause like if you're using Litecoin Core with MWeb, you have, you have, it's basically in a hot wallet, right? So. Yeah. I think he means light as opposed to hot as light an SPV. Wallets. Yeah. So that's something we're working on. Okay, so I guess I ran out of questions for now. Thank you very much, Charlie. It's been a long interview. I'm happy that you're answered to all the questions. I've learned a lot today about how Mimblewimble works and how it works with extension blocks. And I'm going to pay attention to this project and I hope it works out. And maybe that more Bitcoiners are going to become open to the idea of looking into this and maybe adding it to Bitcoin, maybe not this, maybe it will be this. I don't know, but it's still a bold move. It was hard, I guess, to move away from Bitcoin development to add something on top. There's extra complexity. There's going to be more development required right now and more maintenance, but <laughs> it's quite yeah. a journey and congratulations for it. Yep. Thanks a lot, Vlad. fiat on-ramp or off-ramp and you get to diversify your Bitcoin portfolio into gold or silver when you sense that a bearish moment is coming. Also, you can instantly trade your gold for Bitcoin to buy the dip. And if you're into gold custody, Voltoro can also send you the gold that you own directly from their insured Swiss vaulting facilities. Voltoro was launched in the aftermath of the Mt. Gox hack. So since 2015, they have published monthly glass books to prove that they own all the gold reserves and all of their customers' money. Sign up today by going to voltoro.com slash Bitcoin Takeover. Keep in mind that this is not financial advice and you are responsible for your own decisions. Wasabi Wallet is the perfect Bitcoin privacy wallet. It's free, it's open source, it's available on Windows, Mac OS and Linux, and it offers groundbreaking Chamian coin joins, which makes your Bitcoin. Even if you do not use the coin join feature, you still benefit from a trustless experience with block filters, a hidden IP address via Tor, and easy management of your wallet outputs. After you deal with KYC exchanges like Coinbase, like Kraken, Binance, Gemini, or Bitfinex, you can remove the association between your identity and your Bitcoin address by performing a few rounds of coin joins. 
To find out more about the privacy benefits and limitations of coin joins, listen to Bitcoin Takeover Podcast Season 6, Episode 6 with Max Hillbrand. And if you want to give Wasabi a try, go to wasabiwallet.io and download the wallet for free. Wasabi Wallet, a Bitcoin privacy wallet for the citadels.